Good afternoon. Good morning, everyone. Really happy to be here at Constellation Fest with Professor Carl Hart. Carl, how are you going? Oh, it's good to be here with you, Naomi. Always a pleasure. Yeah, thank you so much. We were going to try to be in the same room for this conversation when we had these, these great ambitions when we started planning in the summertime. And actually, yesterday we had a session, um, a chemsec session run by GMHC, where three of them were gathered around the table. And I just thought, this is what daytime TV could be. You know, it was great. They were talking over each other, laughing. But we're going to make the best with our, our two screen lineup. Um, where in the world are you at the moment? Uh, I'm in Paris, actually. I'm at uh, a place called Asud, uh, run by uh, what my good friend Fabrice uh, was the executive director here. And uh, I came here to give a talk for one of his conferences. And then as soon as uh, you and I finish, I have to be on the plane to Brazil. So uh, I'm just happy that I could be here. Fantastic. So this session is build. Um, as drug control, impunity, and justice. Um, so that's what we're going to be getting into for the next 60 minutes. Um, we've got a great crew um, behind the scenes. We've got fantastic participants. Everybody keep your, your comments coming in the chat. And after 20, 30 minutes, um, I'll start pulling those in so, uh, so Carl can answer any questions you have. Um, but Carl, we also talked about, we talked about taking this from the perspective of drug control kind of as an incursion an incursion of the personal space the the everyday challenges associated with drug control so often in human rights and drug policy we spend a lot of time on, on the big stuff um thinking about that framing drug control being used as a tool of social control shame marginalization and exclusion um do you want to kick off the conversation by talking a little bit about your observations or experience about how how it's kind of been used as a tool to incite shame and fear well, um, as you know, drug control has been used uh, as a tool more than just for shame and fear. It's actually been used as a tool to subjugate. Um, and that's it has its origins uh, in subjugating specific populations. Uh, certainly in the U.S., um, our first national drug laws, for example, were passed uh, in order to uh, subjugate uh, Chinese Americans, uh, Black Americans. Um, and that provided, or our sort of hatred of those groups provided the fuel to get those laws passed in the first place. And it has continued subsequently uh, to be extended to other groups like uh, Mexican Americans, poor people, whether they're poor white people, poor black, poor uh, natives. Uh, and so um, um, uh, that's why it's important for us to like question the sort of basic assumptions uh, of our drug control. And, and those basic assumptions is, I mean, that we have to face is that um, the government does not trust you um, to make the right decisions about what you can put in your body. I mean, that's the most basic assumption. And so uh, if we start there, um, uh, people should be upset about that and people should uh, push back. Uh, but there has been, in general, relatively little pushback. Uh, I don't know if because people just think that, well, these drugs are so dangerous, um, so the government should uh, ban their access uh, rather than uh, make their access available, uh, but make them as safe as possible and also control um, uh, the sort of education surrounding them and also uh, controlling the unit dose, all of these things that will enhance the uh, safety of engaging in this activity. And so um, I like to think about these things now in the most simple terms. And, and those simple terms are um, the government doesn't trust you to, um, um, to uh, make the right choice about what you can put in your body. Yeah. yeah, and there's been and there's been so many years of quite like dedicated uh, government and public information campaigns that conflates everything associated with drugs with things that are bad, um, and that kind of plays into the subjugation of ethnic minority, black, brown, and indigenous groups, um, and has really been perpetuated for more than a hundred years now, which is which is why we're having such a hard time reversing it, I think. I, I think we're having a hard time uh, reversing it uh, in large part because of 
uh, the amount of money that's associated with uh, uh, subjugating other people. Um, in the U.S., for example, on paper, we say that it's $40 billion a year currently, uh, but it's more than that. And then so you think about um, all of the people who are employed in order to uh, control what you put in your body. Uh, uh, you, law enforcement is easy. We can think of them, uh, prison authorities, they, they're easy. We know that. But uh, researchers, physicians, uh, the media, uh, all of these people uh, have their hand in the cookie jar, if you will. Um, and that's the real reason that this continues. Uh, and and um, it helps that the people who are primarily negatively impacted are poor and politically weak. Um, uh, and, and, and that's those are the reasons that I think that it really continues. Yeah. And, you know, we like outside the U.S. as well, we see it kind of everywhere from the example of China selling its weapons to the Philippines so it can pursue its war on drugs. You know, that's a lucrative trade deal. Um, you know, at, at a really small scale level, all over sub-Saharan Africa and parts of Asia, you know, the, the everyday policeman on the street is relying on stop and search as a source of like, you know, income because these people are, are paid so poorly around the world that they need these stop and search mechanisms. So like there is this vested interest, the whole chain from the government right down to the people that hold the smallest amount of power and possibly yield it particularly badly. Um, yeah, the, the vested interest comes with a huge amount of money, just not, not even beyond prisons, but the whole kind of war on drugs phenomena. Yeah, so like when we hear people saying that the war on drugs has failed, um, that's not entirely true. The war on drugs uh, continues because it's been a success. Uh, it's been a success for those people who are in control and um, the people who they give their fruits to, like the poorly educated cop or uh, um, uh, those other folks who uh, wouldn't have jobs otherwise. Yeah. yeah. So I the think, war on um, drugs... I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. I was just I was just going to say the war on drugs is a jobs program. Yeah, no, that's not what it says in the International Drug Control Convention, but those are the terms upon which it has been remarkably successful, um, as well as remarkably violent and harmful. Um, the other the other way I think that you know I'm always fascinated by how the war on drugs operates and how drug control policy operates is this kind of this creep and how it, it, it's like the perfect justification for intervention into the personal life. Because the state doesn't trust you, there's that assumption that you put down there. But also it's like the, the rates of stop and search, the ability to take somebody's child away from them, like the urine testing, it's just incredible, like vast and kind of all encompassing justification. You can do whatever you want if you're the state, if it's fighting the war on drugs, right? Absolutely, I mean, um... What we did was we created a threat, the war on drugs. I mean, we said all of these things about people who use drugs. Uh, we say that they're, they're, un they're out of control, uh, they might rob or harm you, and so that you have this threat. And now um, the government, your political officials say, oh, don't worry, I got you. I got your security and, and just vote for me and we'll have these uh, repressive policies to, to protect you. We did it with terrorism, um, and we, but we've done it with drugs before terrorism. But this is, uh, this is not a, a difficult uh, 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 phenomenon to see. Yeah, and the thing that I think the fascinating thing we're being, beginning to see as we analyze how we responded to COVID in the past 12 months, is there are so many parallels between the way that law enforcement has been deployed under the auspices of public health campaign to protect everyone, um, and, the, and they're not entirely positive effects, definitely not public health effects, and the parallels to, between that and, and the war on drugs. And then the very awkward point where the war on drugs and kind of COVID policing in, intersect um, at HRI, we did some, some studies with partners in Indonesia and the Philippines. We hear reports of people being picked up in a COVID raid. And then just in case that violation, that, inco that kind of transgression is not sufficient, um, people are urine tested after they're picked up in a COVID raid. Although there's no basis to suggest that, you know, they need to have, you know, an offence greater than violation of a COVID raid um, put against them. Um, it's, it's like the kind of the mounting of the possible 
charges that uh, that states are able to do with these these justifications. Yeah, um, yeah, I don't know what to say. This has uh, been going on for some time, and I absolutely agree. And um, so the question is, what are we going to do? Um, yeah. And and why do we allow this to continue? Uh, yeah, absolutely, I agree. Yeah. So when you when you travel around the world, Carl, and and you speak at at you know obviously you're invited to speak at a lot of conferences um, after Brazil next. Uh, the solution is different everywhere, and yet and yet there are parallels. Um, if we were obviously you and I sitting here together, don't have all the answers for what's next or, or, or the unturned stones or, you know, what we look to for change next. And it's not our goal to, to solve that for the community, for the sector. You know, when you, when you kind of go around and see the, the parallels everywhere, the, the similar violence and the intersections of race and gender and poverty, um, what kind of comes to your mind in terms of where we should be turning next, what we should be pushing on, what we, what we should be challenging? Yeah, um, when I think about... Uh... Uh, the issues as they relate to drugs uh, around the globe, um, I, I try and keep it very simple. Um, the first thing is that uh, the illicit drug trade, for example, uh, is a multi-billion dollar industry every year. Uh, if, it's, uh, if, you're, if, it, if it requires that amount of money, then poor people alone could not support that industry. And so it tells me that the vast majority of the users are people who are from the middle class, people who are upper class and so forth. Um, but yet our image of the people who are using drugs uh, don't comport with that reality. Um, and so um, it, it tells me one of the things that I've been trying to encourage people to do all around the world, particularly people who when I speak to folks at university or middle to upper class people, it's like get out of the closet and uh, change this image. So if, if your governments uh, see drug users as people who vote and people who they care about, maybe we wouldn't have so many repressive laws uh, that have targeted uh, people with less political power. Uh, and so uh, I try to encourage people to, uh, as, a, as a matter of their civic duty, uh, to get out of the closet and stand up on behalf of those people who, are, who may have limited uh, political power. That's one. Um, uh, a second thing I try to do to, to keep it simple is, is that um, all people who are using drugs uh, uh, are doing, by the way, um, I'm putting aside, for example, for, for, for the moment, those people who meet criteria for addiction. That's a different class. I'm thinking about the majority of people who are using drugs. Um, those people are seeking to alter their consciousness. Um, uh, various groups have different types of language that they may put on it, but everybody's doing the same. Like some group may say, oh, I'm seeking a higher a spiritual plane. I'm trying to be with one with the universe, whatever. Um, everybody's doing the same thing. They're altering their consciousness. And so uh, given that uh, people, some people do alcohol, some people do caffeine, some people do MDMA, some people do heroin, whatever it is, it, uh, the question becomes, um, why aren't we standing up on behalf of everybody um, uh, to be able to um, uh, decide what they want to take or, 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 or their freedom to take it, their liberty to take it? Um, we haven't stood up on behalf of everyone, um, in part because I think a number of people have bought into the to the lies, the misinformation about drugs, what drugs do, what drugs don't do. Um, and so um, um, one of the things I try to do is help educate people to, uh, to understand the real drug effects. Uh, this, is coming, this is coming from someone who has given thousands of doses of these drugs, cocaine, uh, methamphetamine, cannabis, to people in the lab and, and carefully studied the, their 
uh, reactions, their behaviors uh, immediately after the drug effects, uh, uh, weeks after the, the immediate drug effects, uh, and also coming from someone who's a drug user themselves. So um, um, I'm trying to bring all of those experiences to uh, my ability to educate the public, no matter where I'm at. Um, and then uh, uh, the thing that I see around the globe that is universal, uh, the people who are being arrested for drugs, uh, whether it's using, dealing, whatever, uh, in any of these countries are the people who are on the margins uh, uh, of that society. They are the, 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 the despised groups of those societies. So uh, in Northern Ireland, uh, it would be poor white people. In the U.S., it would be primarily black and brown people. But if you go to Oklahoma, it's primarily poor white people. Uh, the Philippines, of course, uh, it's Filipino, poor Filipino people. So it, it depends where you're at around the world, but it's the same people who are being uh, vilified and uh, subjected to the horrors of uh, drug war policing. Uh, and, and so I try to um, um, make the, the people in the uh, community in which I'm speaking aware of the similarities of what's going on in their community to uh, those things that are happening in communities uh, on a different continent. Yeah, that's incredible. And I think even your, you know, your, you yourself as a professor at Columbia, you know, publishing your latest book and standing up and saying, get out of the closet, I use drugs, surely has to be shifting, you know, the way people kind of think about this, think about what it means. So I think one of the, the greatest insults of, of, the, of, of the, the war on drugs of the kind of the toxic approach to drugs campaign is this, this idea that you couldn't possibly retain your agency and your intelligence and your humanity uh, whilst using drugs, which is, which is ludicrous. And it also kind of flies in the face of all logic. Uh, it's that, that idea of kind of almost individual exceptionalism, like, Sure, I can do a little bit of party drug on the weekend, but that type of drug user is different, you know, as in as how, how do people like in their minds separate the, the logical construct between their weekend activities and the type of drug user that the media portrays as, you know, the dividing kind of earlier this week, uh, Kojo, Koram and Ash Saka were talking about how had drug policy been really effective in, in creating a, a deserving poor class versus an undeserving um, class of citizens and it speaks to exactly what you were saying. Um, been very, very effective at being divisive. Yeah, um, you asked the question, how do people justify this different? How do they resolve this cognitive dissonance? Like you're a drug user, why can't someone else uh, use drugs? Uh, I, I, well, you know, as humans, sometimes we like to think of ourselves as special. Um, and I think it may extend to this drug taking behavior kind of thing. Um, um, but of course, um, uh, we're not special, but that, but that's why I try to get people just to focus on the very basic idea of, uh, other people's liberty. Um, you know, if you, uh, one of our sort of civic duties, as I see it, is to protect other people's liberty, not my own, other people's liberty. Um, as long as those people are not preventing uh, someone else from enjoying their liberty. Uh, and so um, when we think about other people having the, the right to their liberty, um, and that means they can do whatever they like, short of um, preventing other people from uh, doing the same. Um, uh, if we start there, uh, and uh, it makes it difficult for people to um, uh, 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 justify um, uh, uh, preventing other people from engaging in drug use or any other behavior that they see fit. Um, um, so I try to keep the conversation at that level, uh, because when you start, when you take it to other levels, they people start to come up with these hypotheticals. Uh, what if they uh, rob someone when they're high? It's like, well, we have laws against that. We have laws for, for robbery. robbery. We, we have laws to deal with those kind of things. And, 
And, and so that's why I try to just keep it very basic because it is very basic and very simple. Um, uh, we have made it or tried to make it complicated to pull a wool over people's eyes. Yeah. And, you know, we society is able to hold that idea within our heads, right? Nobody fears the middle class person that is able to close their front door behind them and use cocaine in private, right? It's only this 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 kind of moralizing societal perspective. Um, in the UK, they like to say pearl clutching. This idea of like, ooh, <laughs> this kind of fear yeah. created this idea that, that there is another category of people that we couldn't possibly understand, the other, um, which is so far-fetched and, and so unimaginable when we're all just pottering around every day trying to be humans. Or there are drugs that people have in that exception category as well. They say, well, this drug is so addictive, we cannot have anyone use that drug. Um, that's, when, that's why I say we should ban that drug because I care about the society and I don't want people to become addicted. You know, the vast majority of people, uh, the vast majority of users of any drug don't meet criteria for addiction. Um, addiction has very little to do with the drug itself. Uh, when I say addiction, I mean the DSM criteria, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of the DSM, uh, I mean of the American Psychiatric Association and the International Classification of Disorders. There are symptoms, 11 of them or so, and people endorse these symptoms and they are troubled by that. That's what I mean when I say addiction. I don't mean physical dependence. Uh, where someone is taking a drug and then they abruptly discontinue, then they have some withdrawal symptoms. Uh, people will have withdrawal symptoms from taking an antidepressant medication for uh, some period of time. So I'm not talking about physical dependence. I'm talking about this thing we have, uh, we call addiction in medicine, uh, where people meet criteria for having uh, their life kind of disrupted and they are disturbed by those disruptions. Those are the two components of addiction. Yeah, and you've, you've done quite a lot of study and writing into like what it actually means to take a drug and people's experience of taking, you know, a wide range of drugs, right? It's, and, and kind of it completely disrupts everything um, that you read in kind of mainstream press. Yeah, um, the studies that we've done where we, we bring people into the lab and we give them a drug under certain conditions and under other conditions, they have the, they can make a choice to uh, uh, choose to take the drug or not take it or take some other sort of option like money or something else, uh, a food treat or something of that nature. Uh, yeah, we've done tons of those studies. And the bottom line is that um, drug taking behavior follows the principles of just like any other behavior. The, the principles that govern drug taking behavior also govern the behaviors of engaging in sexual intercourse, also governs the behavior of whether you will study for your exam or how well you do. The same principles are, are in operation when people take drugs. Drugs do not uh, cause people to be so cognitively impaired uh, that it uh, compromises their ability to make choices. I mean, obviously, someone can take enough drug to be so intoxicated that they have uh, they are temporarily cognitively impaired in some domains. Obviously, you can do that with alcohol, but I'm not talking about just this temporary sort of uh, cognitive uh, impairment that people kind of seek in order to check out. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about these long-term things that uh, folks uh, speculate about that just haven't, hasn't been shown. Yeah, yeah. And, that, and I think that's a, a huge, huge nugget of that kind of fear campaign that we see in the war on drugs. Um, our old boss at, at Harm Reduction International, Rick Lyons, points out that, you know, of all the international treaties in the world, their drug control conventions is, are the only one that use the word evil, such an emotive term to describe, you know, the content of treaty matter. And it just, it, it's embedded to such an extent, it's quite extraordinary. Well, you know, I, I didn't realize the evil com, uh, statement is that I didn't know that was in there, but thank you for letting me know. And But what it highlights is that whenever you're talking about drugs, even in these international uh, conventions where everyone pours over every word uh, before it goes out. Uh, 
uh, even in these international conventions, people, uh, if they're talking about drugs, they can be intellectually lazy. They don't have to work as hard. This is what happens in, in many of our uh, films about drugs. If you watch any film about drugs, they are almost always wrong, intellect, intellectually lazy. Uh, they don't have to develop characters if they simply say, oh, this person uses heroin or this person uh, is addicted to cocaine or but they do not have to develop any characters. The drug dealers, they don't have to de develop those characters. Um, they're just evil. Um, and that should tell people uh, some things in the society. Uh, and, and when we see these kind of films, these news reports, um, documentaries on, we should um, push back and we should uh, raise hell about this. We should say how inappropriate that is. And what it does is that it reinforces uh, uh, these stereotypes in this sort of unidimensional way that we think of drugs and the people who use drugs. And that contributes to the draconian policies. And that's why it's so important for us to push back on all of these things. Yeah, and that idea that we see in film and television, it's entirely binary. You're either a person who uses drugs who's deeply troubled or you're recovering and you've stopped using drugs. It, it can't be like any kind of anything in the middle where you use drugs and have a happy, healthy life. It's got to be one or the other because if you're using drugs, you fit into this, this character stereotype. And if you're trying to get better, everybody like looks upon you with like, you know, pity and, and, and ho hopes you uh, make your way back, like struggle back. It's, it's like the Christian journey, basically, um, which, is, which is a really depressing way to start any conversation that it has to be one or the other. Yeah, no, uh, that's right. What, what is also uh, insidious and, and pernicious in, in that sort of situation you just described is that you co-op uh, the folks who uh, once used the drug and had problems with it. You kind of co-op them uh, in order to uh, peddle this nonsense um, that uh, these drugs cause all this disruptions in, in my life. And uh, so therefore, you know, uh, I've been clean for how many years that people have been clean, that's fine. Um, and, and, but the, the problem is that they misattribute oftentimes uh, what the problems really were in their life or the cause of those problems. So um, you see some person who, I don't know, they may be 30 something, 40 something, 50 something, whatever. And then they say they've been clean for 10, 15, 20 years. Um, um, and then you ask them to describe the time in which they had these problems with the drug. And then you discover that they were some young person in their teens, early 20s or 20s. Um, and, uh, and, 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 but they attribute these problems to the drug and not the fact that they were immature as we all were and not the fact that we all make mistakes at that that age and we continue to make the mistakes um and so a lot of that had to do with uh development or lack thereof and and they almost never talk about that sort of thing uh and so it, it just blows my mind how we as a society uh accept that with drugs i mean can you imagine Someone says, uh, yeah, you know, I had some awful sexual intercourse sort of experiences uh, in my 20s and then uh, I abstained. And so my life is better. You know, it was because of the, uh, the sexual intercourse. Uh, no, it was because of our lack of development, you know, and but nobody would say that. And we would look at the person like they were nuts if they would say that they have abstained uh, from sex because of these negative uh, experiences that they may have had when they were a young person, like we all uh, kind of have. Um, uh, it's silly, but w with yeah, drugs, yeah. we accept that. We accept that. Exactly. As being, and this um, is... uh, I'm sorry. I'm interviewing you. You get to talk first. No, no, no. I'm sorry. No, no, please. I'm sorry. I'm done. Um, and just it's this idea that people have to like, you know, block off that little bit of their identity and their history and hold it separate from who they are today to say, I have been clean since. And this is kind of separation from the person that they were. Whereas really, we're all just like, you know, making mistakes the whole time, trying to work it out.
Um, and it seems grossly unfair. People have to like carve out this piece of who they were and, and say, I'm not that anymore. Um, yeah, but you have to understand too, though, uh, there is uh, a lot of positive regard, a lot of love for people to say that. There is a lot of reinforcement for people to say, uh, I'm clean now. And, you know, um, uh, but I had that experience. And uh, one of the things that's kind of implied too is that what I went through would kill a less of a human. But, you know, I am strong, so I'm still here. Uh, that's also uh, operating in the background. It's not stated, but that's operating in the background. And, um, and that's that's something that people need to be aware of. Yeah. Um, so we've hit about halfway through our hour together. So I've started to scan the chat. Um, now, it's pretty difficult to convert all the emojis and high fives and claps, um, the forms of love send it, being sent your way. Um, but we do have a question from Julia Zampini. Um, do you think it's useful to frame the war on drugs as a policy failure to mobilize people towards reform? Great question. Uh, as a policy failure? No, I don't think it's useful to um, frame it as a policy failure. I think that uh, when we think about, uh, so we assume uh, that the goal of the war on drugs is what? I don't know. I think the stated goal is to lessen uh, the availability of these substances in, 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 in our communities. Uh, at some level, uh, the war on drugs certainly did that. Uh, I mean, we think about um, uh, cannabis in the U.S., uh, in states where uh, cannabis has been legalized. Um, now, uh, arguably, cannabis is more available uh, in those states where it is legalized uh, than it was before when it was illegal. I mean, it's certainly more available to uh, uh, regular folk. Uh, and so at some, if we think about the stated policy of the war on drugs, like the decrease to uh, availability of these substances, it, it worked, you know, uh, that's a stated policy. And then you think about the unstated sort of goal of the war on drugs and to increase the budgets of various or uh, select groups of people that it worked there as well. Um, I, I don't, I don't know if that's the most useful way to think about reform. Uh, I mean, uh, with cannabis reform in the United States, we've seen that one useful way is to show uh, law enforcement and the rest of the people uh, who have power in our society, how they can make money off of this endeavor, uh, that, that endeavor being uh, legally regulating the market. Um, uh, if when they find out how they can, if they discover or if they understand how they can make money off of uh, drug legal regulation, um, then they may move, they'll move to it. Uh, we've seen the sort of uh, uh, human rights violations and uh, uh, racial discrimination and the targeting of poor people, we see how that has not been compelling at all. Um, we all live in capitalistic societies and uh, the capitalism uh, argument seems to have been the one that has moved the society. Um, uh, and so I think we need to really think about um, what we're doing and what we're and, and how we advocate for a change. Yeah, and it, but again, all those changes when you're you're trying to shift power away from the power, most powerful, like the war on drugs is really very deeply linked to the colonial project, right? Uh, the control of resource people, people and wealth uh, by Western powers in in you know in invasion of other countries, and and the post-colonial model which continues that uh, via versions of trade agreements and, you know, operation of programs under the International Drug Control Conventions. And it continues to oppress and disadvantage um, marginalized groups, ethnic minorities, um, people who are not sitting in, in the Palace of Westminster in London or, or Capitol Hill in the US. Um, okay, so we've got some more questions. Um, Constellations team, what do you recommend we take next? Jay Walker says, Imagine someone told you that they've abstained from a sec from sexual inter intercourse because of a bad experience. Nope, I think this is um 
he's just kind of reinforcing that point you've um you've just made carl um mm. that makes sense you would look at them like they're silly of course of course um we're missing any other questions in the chat neve eastwood has reminded me that the only other international treaty to use the term evil is around sex work we're in good company yeah leave it to e uh, to neve to uh remind us where's neve she, she was supposed to be here right she didn't show up no i'm joking <laughs> quick get her on the phone <laughs> um not ethnic minorities but people uh says red medusa people belonging to the global majority just a point absolutely uh, what well, we are talking about the global majority um seeing about kind of ethnic minority as a, as a further iteration within a country like the further iteration of like who is most likely to be prosecuted for a drug crime in kenya um but you're right it's broadly the global majority um yeah but uh, no that's that, it's important for us to understand we're talking about when, when we're talking about majority, we're talking about who has the power majority, not not necessarily numbers. I mean, that's a that's not we. This is not that that this conversation. We're we're, we're talking about what's important. Uh, the people who are in power, the people who have money. Um, uh, in the U.S., we know like the top one percent or so run everything. Um, uh, that's the majority. That's who has the majority of the influence um uh, and and they influence uh many people who are not in the uh, the that their minority uh and so their their influence grows in terms of numbers because they determine uh those people's salary they determine uh, a, a a lot of how those people behave yeah um so kind of a segue off that ruth goldsmith has asked a question this one spend a lot of time thinking about hard drugs, soft drugs, clean, unclean. How much do we have to change language to move forward on this? Um, it frustrates me to, to no end to, to think that people can kind of like bisect the range of, of illicit substances out there, particularly when it's a constantly evolving category into things that are hard and soft and, and more manageable. Um, language is important. Uh, language is it's important to be precise as possible. But we don't want to get hung up on language because I'm watching the today people are getting hung up too much on language to where they forget the phenomena of interest. Um, clearly, you if you have, hear somebody talking about hard drugs versus soft drugs, yeah, it's nice to correct them, but move on and stay focused on this big issue. Uh, the big issue is: Do people have the right to put? Uh, whatever drug in their bodies um uh, that's the big issue uh, um and, and and language of course is important but please don't get hung up on it yeah yeah no and i think it is it's about your your own use of your body isn't it we've done quite a few really interesting sessions around pleasure um because it is it's something that i think you know, some parts of the harm reduction movement are so far ahead on this and really done the thinking and the analysis and can talk about it with such competence, but it's something that the sector at large is still kind of struggling to, to get their head around to grapple with. Um, the, you know, the idea that we can, you know, it's okay to seek pleasure and, and that is a large part of why uh, people use drugs. Um, got to get over that That's hump as well and start talking about that language, the language of pleasure. Well, that's the, that's the reason why I wrote the new book. Um, I wanted to show the pleasures uh, associated with using drug drugs and not focus on the uh, sort of negative aspect that has dominated this conversation. Uh, and me simply saying that uh, there's been a disproportionate focus on the negative aspects of drug use. Uh, and so I'm going to talk about the pleasure, the positive aspects. Oh my God, I upset so many people by simply saying that sort of thing. Uh, but personally, uh, I discovered that, uh, you know, I deserve to have pleasure uh, well into my 40s and 50s. You know, that's a new discovery. And I'd be damned if I'm going to let somebody tell me that 
I can have alter my consciousness to have pleasure. Uh, pleasure is a good thing. If I'm happy and uh, enjoying pleasure, I'm more likely to treat people better. Uh, and that's what we, we want. We want people in our society who treat other people well. We don't want people to be upset, angry. Uh, then they're more likely to cause stress and harm to those other folks. Uh, we want people to be happy. That's a good thing. It's even a sad thing that I have to even say that sentence. Pleasure, that's a good thing. No yeah. shit. <laughs> when did we miss the point on that one? <laughs> um, we've got a great uh, question from Gabby Brunning. Uh, how do we foster positive conversations about drug use without shame and stigma when current government views drug use in a criminal mode? Um, and Gabby's in Australia and the Australian Federal Police has just released this like the most horrendous advertising campaign, um, which suggests that a person who uses meth, you know, ice is a drug that's highly demonized in the Australian context, suggests that a person who uses meth behind the wheel of a car is the danger to all of society um, and is the ultimate danger and, and just uses like horrendously graphic images. Um, so Gabby says she's always having conversations about this, changing it to positive language, but we need to do more as a collective. What would you say to Gabby Carr? I don't understand the question, really. I mean, this is uh, really simple. You know, like the, the advertisement that you just described, it's complete bullshit. You know, um, uh, Japanese soldiers in the Second World War, uh, they were, uh, their pilots were on amphetamines, methamphetamines specifically. Our pilots are still take amphetamines uh, and they have these billion dollar planes that they operate um, uh, and they're on amphetamines to make sure that they are alert, awake. Um, and so this kind of nonsense, I mean, that's so easy to address. Uh, I mean, I published extensively on uh, methamphetamine specifically. Uh, and uh, when I talk about all the benefits of methamphetamine, methamphetamine in the U.S. is a is an uh, FDA approved medication to treat attention deficit disorder, this cognitive sort of issue. Uh, it's also approved to treat obesity in our country. Um, uh, it is medically available. Uh, and so when you hear you see these kind of advertisement or uh, or anti-drug campaigns, this is so easy uh, to uh, combat. Um, yeah, I, uh, just please check out anything I've written on, on this. Yeah, kind of an extension of that, Jada Girelli has got a question talking about language and representation. Carl makes an important point about having to better include pleasure in the conversation around drugs. Thank you to Constellation for doing that. How do we get there though? Um, I think we just have to keep on talking about it. What do you think, Carl? Well, you know, one of the things that uh, uh, people have gotten twisted, um, I mean, we all have similar heroes all around the world, uh, people who we look up to. Um, there are a number of people who look up to Nelson Mandela or someone else uh, who, uh, who stay with um, uh, some issue related to injustice and they fought. Uh, those people paid a, a heavy price, all of our heroes, all of these people we admire, uh, because there is risk when you are fighting injustice. Uh, and all of those people who we admire uh, took those risks and they pay, in some cases, dearly. Uh, the same is true here. This is an injustice. So expect to put yourself at risk and to uh, maybe pay the price. but. This is wrong. What we're doing is wrong. And it causes me a lot more harm not to do anything uh, than the harm that may come to me for doing something. Uh, and, and so if you're not at that place, then you're probably in the wrong fight. Yeah. That's a lot to think about. Um. So we've got, uh, gosh, I'm sorry, the, the comments are rolling in so fast, I can't, uh, I can't keep up with them. Um, Sean Shelley, however, the data does not influence people with closed minds. Yes, I have noticed that, Sean, it's pretty, pretty embarrassing and very frustrating. Do we not need to use narratives and work on humanizing people to change hearts first so minds will follow? 
Uh, that's my dear friend, Sean. Sean. Sean, you know better. You know the answer to this. Uh, it's not an either or thing. Uh, you know, you you use data where data will be influential. You know, one of the things that I do, as you know, Sean, um, when I write my books and so forth, there's a lot of anecdote, but I try to bolster the anecdote with data uh, because I think the audience that I'm writing for, they appreciate data, but you always have to have a good story. Because if you don't have a good story, nobody's going to stick around because it's going to bore them to death. And so uh, we have good, compelling stories. I mean, this is one of the reasons that I got out of the closet, you know, to have this compelling story. You know, people oftentimes say, you know, drug users are irresponsible, uh, some negative um, adjective to describe uh, drug users. And then so... Uh, I, I figured I'd get out of the closet and, and, and then people see my list of accomplishments. It's like, okay, check the record and now say those negative sort of things. Uh, uh, and, and, and so uh, I try to make myself uh, a, a story. Uh, but of course, people have, um, uh, some people have said stupid shit about that. But that, the point is, is that we can use, we use, we all have a story and we tell those stories and we know stories and 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 we tell those stories and uh, knowing the evidence uh, will um, help you with uh, uh, some groups as well. Yeah. Um, Sebastian Savills popped in with a question as well. Is there too much worrying about who um, would control the regulated market? Is uh, what, what did my friend Sebastian say? I'm is sorry. there too is much there too worrying? Much yeah i think uh yeah um uh i think sebastian knows the answer to this question that's why he asked uh is there uh yeah there there are there's certainly groups of people who um worry about who will control the, the regulated market um that's certainly the case uh, when we think about legalizing cannabis in the u.s for example uh, the people who are there, who are um, uh, controlling the market and also the businesses who got there are, uh, again, the people who are the well-to-do in society. Um, and so obviously uh, that's some concern, but uh, I don't know if that's a concern that we should be worried about at this point when we have, uh, we have yet to even... Uh, uh, have a serious conversation about legally regulating the market. Um, so the first goal in my mind is to take the chains off uh, and, and then we can uh, worry about um, uh, that other sort of uh, issue about who's who's controlling the market. But that's not my first priority. My first priority is to free the people. People had it here first, kids. Um... Better than going to prison, says Sebastian. That's exactly yeah. right. And you can say that again. Thank you, Sebastian. Yeah. Um, just scrolling back up. Kasia Malinowska has said, NIDA spends millions on document, documenting negative consequences of the war on drugs. Um, UN drug control offices in Vienna have a budget of millions. There's no agency on this planet other than some smart, brave NGOs that are talking about how drugs contribute to our lives in positive ways. Um, and Carl Hart. <laughs> um, thank you, Kasha. I couldn't agree more. I think it's, uh, it goes back to that conversation Carl and I were having at the beginning about the vested interest, the millions and millions of dollars um, backing punitive response to drugs, backing the war on drugs, and how that's something we really well, need to kind of back, get ourselves out of that corner. Well, uh, Kasha raised an issue that uh, we should think about when um, uh, when we see science or people presenting science on drugs, uh, we should make sure that they have as their funder NIDA as a conflict of interest. Uh, we should make sure that we raise this point um, um, and, uh, and, and we should always look to see who's funding the study. Uh, because we get concerned when pharmaceutical companies are funding studies and we want people to disclose. But we don't require the same sort of disclosure 
uh, when people have uh, grants from the U.S. Uh, government like NIDA, uh, when in fact NIDA uh, uh, is uh, uh, more biased, if not so, if, if uh, they are equally or or more biased as the pharmaceutical companies, and so we need to uh, we need to acknowledge that in a, a more formal way. Yeah. I think there was an earlier question from Buff Cameron um, while we're on the US asking if you could talk more about cocaine and crack drug laws in the US. Uh, yeah, so uh, Buff is asked, uh, Buff is, uh, I, guess, I guess this is a question related to the 1986 law that uh, punished crack cocaine uh, violations a hundred times more harshly than powder cocaine violations. That is, people caught with small amounts of, of, of crack were required to go to jail for a mandatory minimum sentence of five years. Uh, in order to trigger the same sentence with powder cocaine, one had to uh, have a hundred times more powder cocaine. Uh, that's the law that Buff is talking about. That law, uh, under that law, uh, uh, in the 90s, uh, Black people were convicted uh, or uh, under that law, uh, they represent black people represented ninety percent of all the people convicted uh, under that law, uh, even though they did not represent ninety percent of the um, crack users. In fact, they didn't even represent the majority of the crack users or dealers. Uh, and so, uh, uh, people were concerned about the, the law being uh, enforced in a racially discriminatory manner. Um, it's important for us to know about that law and subsequent laws too. Uh, that law, because um, uh, we oftentimes think of it as being like our white politicians being racist and so forth. Uh, no, uh, they, they may be, but that law doesn't demonstrate it. Um, uh, because uh, the, the majority of the Black con Congressional Caucus voted for that law. Uh, like 16 of the 20 members voted for that law. And uh, Republicans, Democrats, uh, Black, White, liberals, conservative, they all supported these tough laws on drugs. And they always, they all currently do. Um, so it's important to understand and that uh, when there are members from these despised groups who are selling out uh, people uh, from their group. Um, and that has always happened. That's currently happening today. Uh, when we think about the Democratic Party, uh, they behave just like the Republican Party in the US on, on drug laws, uh, on drug issues. Uh, and that has always happened in the history of U.S. drug laws from the turn of the 20th century um, uh, because you have these people from these despised groups uh, who have made it or, or who are seeking to have made it. Uh, and so as a way of showing the dominant culture, hey, I'm like you, I'm, I'm not like those other niggas, I'm like you. Um, and so the drug laws become a way for them to show that they are different. Um, um, and so uh, uh, there are members in despised groups who participate wholeheartedly in the subjugation of members in, of their, their, their despised group. And, and that's one of the things that we haven't focused on enough uh, in our field. Uh, we haven't talked about the complicity of the members from the despised groups. Uh, and, and to finish off Buff's point, uh, in 2010, Barack Obama signed into legislation um, um, uh, this law that um, uh, decreased the, the disparity from how crack and powder were treated from uh, 100 to 1 to 18 to 1. The two drugs are still not equated, even though uh, from a pharmacological perspective, they're the same drug. Um, and so it's the only case, the only law that we treat a drug differently based on its route of administration. Um, so uh, um, uh, people have said that, well, at least Barack Obama, 
lessen the, the disparity. Uh, but Barack Obama ran on uh, this sort of issue of he was going to get rid of the disparity. And then when this law was passed, he acted as if it was a victory and there was no more to be done. And so for me, that's the real crime. Um, uh, uh, you know, we're happy to have some relief, but you don't act like this is the victory and you don't act like this was the prize. And, 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 and so he counts this as like one of his big achievements, uh, which is uh, disheartening. Um, and uh, it harkens back to this issue of people uh, from despised groups selling out members of their group. Yeah, the, the allure of power is really quite overwhelming, I think, when, when presented to you. I think, you know, we're also humans. Are also such... yeah, it's on. not only power, it's the fruits of power, because he's not in power anymore, and he, st and he still hasn't really said anything about this. So it's the fruits that people gain from being uh, close to power or in power. It's these fruits. Because everybody can't be power, the power. Yeah, yeah. And I think, you know, when what, what you were saying about the, you know, brought it down to 18 times more punitive as opposed to 100, like, I think the one of the most difficult things we're battling against is, is people cheering, like, tiny incremental gains. Um, kind of governments and, and humans broadly are such relative creatures. Like, oh, it's a little bit better, we should celebrate. But if we need to really like step back and see where it should have started versus where it should be improving to, as opposed to like it's, it's racist, you know, it's oppressionist uh, origins and where like the, the little hop it's taken along, along the spectrum to improvement. But, but yeah, it, it's a process. Um, so we are coming towards the end of the hour, and there's a, a lovely question from Claudio Stoiscescu, um, who asks, Carl, um, what are the surprising and positive reactions um, to your book, particularly those from unlikely persons? Um, there have been so many uh, surprising and positive reactions. Uh, last week, I believe I was in Las Vegas, which, by the way, is hell on earth. Um, um, it's one of the worst places to go, but I was there, there uh, giving a talk and it was the first time being out since the pandemic and, and, uh, talking about the book. So people had an opportunity to share with me their sort of reaction. Uh, and it was overwhelming because people, um, were able to let go of their shame about this activity that they had been engaged in for many years, but unable to share with people. And um, they, uh, they were able to uh, read the book and not feel so shameful and feel so alone. Uh, that's been an extremely positive reaction. Um, uh, another sort of uh, unexpected thing that has happened is that um, uh, there have been a lot of uh, people in our country who uh, really understand this issue of liberty, and we might not agree on a number of political issues, but here at this basic fundamental level of people's liberty, we agree, and they hadn't thought about drugs in the past, and now they're thinking about what we're doing with people's liberty with drugs. And so that, that's that been a, a, a really encouraging uh, development. Um, yeah, I, I've got so, got so much love. I, I just, I don't know how to thank people. I just, um, uh, so I'm trying to advocate on behalf of, of, of people. Uh, and also I can't forget the people who are suffering from uh, pain uh, chronic pain, and they've been cut off uh, for their opioids uh, because of our war on drugs. Um, and that community also has been really helpful. I've learned a lot from that, that community, learned a lot that, uh, about people killing themselves because, you know, they've been maintained on these medications for decades in some cases, and now they're cut off. I mean, they've been safe, happy, now they're cut off uh, because of our war on drugs. And so I have to do better in terms of making sure that I don't forget about the pain community. Um, these folks uh, uh, are also victims of the war on drugs. I think you're, um, you're inspiring all of us to do better, Carl. 
Um, so just to recap on, on Carl's key points going forward, get out of the closet. Sorry, first time this week and the sun's come in the door. Um, share information, evidence-based information, and we need to really, really dismantle this idea of the despised group um, and stop, stop allowing the, the other to be, uh, the faceless other to be used to create fear um, in the community and society. People are begging you to speak for seven more hours, Carl. Uh, Carl I can't even begin to get through the comments here. Um, in addition to the positive reactions to your book, I hope you feel the love from everybody at Constellations Fest today. Thank you so, so much for being with us. It's, as always, an absolute pleasure to speak to you. Any final oh, words? No, thank, uh, thank you for having me. And, you know, uh, I see uh, the, the comments that you said from people like Sean, Sebastian, and uh, Neve, Kasha, all of these people I miss and I hope to see uh, soon. I, I mean, those people are... Uh, they kind of provided the, the fuel for my energy. Uh, they actually kind of uh, uh, made sure my uh, mental health was, was intact. So I, I, uh, I miss those people. Yeah. Yeah. Pretty sure they'd say they miss you too. Cool. Thank you so much, everybody. Have a great afternoon.